Hello and welcome to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos, and I am here today with Stephen Ida, who is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. He researches state and local finance and social policy questions uh, such as homelessness and mental illness. And this is another in um, hopefully a continuing series of interviews with people who contributed to the Violence Reduction Project, which is a collection of about 30 uh, or so essays uh, related to the rise in violence last year in 2020 and what we can do about it now uh, to counter it, uh, to bring down violence. And that is available um, at qualitypolicing.com as is this podcast. But if you go to qualitypolicing.com, you'll can get a link to the Violence Reduction Project and um, the essay by Stephen, which is um, titled uh, More Supervision for the Mentally Ill. Um, could you, um, well, first of all, welcome Stephen. And um, I don't know, can you tell me about the uh, the essay? Yeah, sure. Thanks Peter for, <clears throat> for, for the, the invitation. Um, I try to organize my essay around the concept of supervision. Uh, more supervision for the mentally ill might be a way to reduce violence overall. That's how we would meet the overall goal of this project. Um, when we talk about the challenge of, of mental illness and the challenge of how, in, the, in a way that leads towards um, disorder and crime, and in some cases violence, um, a lot of times we, we're talking about treatment. Um, treatment is a medical term, and studies, uh, epidemiological studies that have done of the population have shown that uh, the mentally ill population are go untreated at a very high rate. A very high number of people with serious num mental illness do not receive the treatment that they need. Um, that is um, really the ultimate goal of what we're trying to get to with mental illness policy. But I think supervision is a concept that gets us towards treatment and maybe more meaningful in a policy sense. It's not really a medical concept, but it's a term that policymakers may find more useful to think about when they're trying to get people or organize systems in a way that are more conducive to letting the medical professionals do the work that needs to be done ultimately to stabilize people with untreated serious mental illness. So that's why I tried to emphasize the concept of supervision as a general way of thinking about what we're trying to do here. And do we have data on um, the percentage of mentally ill who do become violent on the streets? And similarly, do we have any data on the percentage of crime committed by people in crisis by, that have mental illness that could in theory be treated? Well, it's a very controversial con idea at all, I should say, just to frame the, um, my response, um, that mentally ill people um, are violent at all. Um, um, there's been a movement dating back many decades to um, frame the mental illness challenge um, as a disability rights challenge and, as, and thus as essentially a civil rights challenge. Um, what we're trying to do is integrate the disabled mentally ill people into society um, they have been, they're longstanding victims of oppression, just like racial minorities, and thus, and they are um, no more harmful than the non-mentally ill population. Um, <clears throat> however, the studies that have been done that look very carefully at the mentally ill population and find them to be no more violent or, um, or prone to criminal activity than the rest of the population often leave out population, the, po the portion of the mentally ill population that are in hospitals, that are in jails and prison, and thus give an artificial slant on, um, on the, gen the basic propensity to violence. It is certainly true that the vast majority of the, mental the seriously mentally ill population, the seriously mentally ill population would be about four to 5% of the adult population as a whole. Yes, that population, generally speaking, is not prone towards violence. However, um, the, if you look at the untreated seriously mentally ill population, um, then they do seem to participate in um, criminal activity and acts of violence at a rate higher than that of the non-mentally ill general U.S. adult population. Um, about 15% is a figure that 15 to 20% of the seriously mentally ill population is incarcerated. 
um, that is that has been a figure that was persistently high for a long time, even throughout the um, recent decline in the jail and prison population. Um, and you know, studies looking at the at the um, so you have a 15 to 20 percent of the incarcerated population versus only four to five percent of the general adult population. That suggests, I think, at, at the very least, an uh, involvement in criminal criminal activity, an elevated rate, in an, at an elevated way. Um, and you could there have also been studies um, that have done by, for example, the New York City um, IBO, the Independent Budget Office, looking at um, the kind of charges that people with uh, mental disorders um, are charged with versus the general jail population. And they seem to be charged with um, more serious crimes than the, than the non, than the rest of the population without mental disorders. So that, in, at least in a very basic way, indicates that when people with mental illness don't receive treatment, um, then yeah, they're more likely to engage in criminal activity than the rest of the population. Sorry to be verbose. No, no, that's good. Um, and, you, and I'm, a, you know, I, I'm hesitant to even frame some of these questions because mental illness is not my field. So um, if I say something um, that needs to be corrected or explained, um, you know, let me know, because I'm asking the mental illness part of this very much as a, just a, you know, a lay person. Um, so what, what, per, is there a, accepted figure or a known figure for um, the percentage of people incarcerated who have um, serious mental illness? I know it's high, but. I, um, well, it can be a little bit complicated gathering those start, those types of statistics in a very precise way because jails are run by counties. And whenever you're trying to gather data from local system, there's just a lot of variation and um, messiness um, across the nation as a whole. Um, and also definitions of serious mental illness can um, vary. Um, and probably in many jail systems, there's not a necessarily a great amount of diagnostic work um, being done. Um, you're also talking about a very transient population, but that all being said, I would say that um, 15 to 20% would be a, um, a reasonable estimate. And, and mental the, um, illness, of course, is a broad category. Um, yeah. What, what are the, diagnoses we're talking about um, in terms of, well, and yeah, in, ter in terms of the population that will end up incarcerated. I assume it's, it's, you know, I assume depression is not high on the list and schizophrenia is, but can you, can you, is that possible to, can you break that down at all? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the terms have changed over the years and different um, service systems and different levels of government are not always defining the terms in exactly the same way, um, which makes everything very complicated. But, you know, the, the term that most policymakers use is serious mental illness or severe mental illness to distinguish the especially troublesome population from people people with general mental disorder, people with anxiety, people who have like hoarding disorders or something like that. Um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, lists dozens and dozens of various diagnoses, um, but which, with, which are conditions that someone could be diagnosed with but live a perfectly functional, normal life, if not a flourishing, happy one. Um, serious mental illness technically means that four to five percent of the adult population that is a subset of the broader population with some form of um, mental disorder um, whose condition is so serious that they have difficulty functioning in normal adult life. They can't help maintain regular uh, relationships with friends and family. They can't hold down a job. Um, they may have difficulty performing just basic daily functions. Um, and the, so it's serious mental illness technically is defined in terms of functionality, but generally speaking, yeah, you're talking about schizophrenia and bipolar disorder would be the two leading condition diagnoses that we're talking about, especially within the criminal justice um, context, also the homelessness context. Um, so technically you could have other diagnoses than those and qualify, be, and qualify as serious mental illness, but generally speaking, Schizophrenia and bipolar disorder would be the two um, two we're mostly talking about, and presumably that is both that would both be made worse and be a cause of homelessness, right? Yeah, the way I like to talk about it is 
you know, people with schizophrenia are, are very difficult to live with. Um, and even when they have housing in the sense that they live with their families who are trying to care for them, um, as many, you know, journalistic accounts of, for example, subway pushings um, attest um, that, you know, schizophrenia it, it develops in the late teen, early, early 20 years. Um, and um, especially when it goes untreated, um, they become very difficult to manage. They become resistant to the type of restraints that their families are trying to place on them, probably often for their own good. Um, and then there, there's a break. Um, and, and I should also say that, especially if you're talking about low-income communities um, or, well, any family, if there are small children around, there are other people in the family whose welfare needs to be taken into consideration for various, it may just be impractical to try to keep this individual at home. So the bond breaks, and that's in addition to, yes, there are these economic issues. You can't hold down a job if you had Lord schizophrenia, but, um, you know, but socially it's, it's a problem. And thus it's, it's, you know, unfortunately it's understandable, if that's the right word, why so many people wind up on the streets in that condition. I mean, I presume that, you know, everybody who pushes someone in front of a subway train um, and there, well, there's certainly anecdotal evidence, but I believe there's data to support it isn't, it has been increasing the past um, two years in New York or since 2020. Um, I assume everyone who pushes someone in front of a subway train has a serious mental problem. Um, I don't think it's, it's, you know, I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's a safe assumption. Is there something about, what is it about schizophrenia that makes some people want to push someone in front of like, a subway train like i you know i don't get it obviously what what's the connection between schizophrenia and sort of random violence well um you know schizophrenia is a thought disorder thought disorder um um you obviously um <clears throat> um interpret the world around you in a very different way than um than um than other people do um it is true that that can happen in a, in a somewhat a just silly, comical, essentially harmless way. Um, and even many people who have violent tendencies in the early, when it first comes on, sort of calm down a bit in their later years, some, sort of parallel to how people talk about aging out of, of crime. Um, but I think that uh, I, don't, I don't have a good um, medical explanation for your question. Um, they, they uh, interpret other uh, experiences, interactions, things that people say in a way that they regard as, as threatening. Um, and thus from their perspective, they need to commit certain acts from, the, from, a, um, from a self-defense perspective often that other people would say were, were not, uh, you know, they were not, they were not in any real threat. And is this tied to hearing voices or is that a different diagnosis? Um, yeah. Yeah. Schizophrenia would be, um, that would be a symptom of schizophrenia. Yes. And yeah, I, it's those voices are almost never telling you good things, unfortunately, um, which is interesting. Some, some schizophrenic people can become um, functioning, some even high functioning Um um, there are, um, but, you know, one thing that I've noticed is that when you talk about memoirs that people write of overcoming mental illness, there are a lot of memoirs about overcoming depression. There's some about overcoming bipolar disorder. There aren't a lot about overcoming schizophrenia. There are some, but they seem to be fewer in number, especially of the, of the um, depression, overcoming depression genre. So, um, it's a really tragic thing, and it's especially tragic for the families that have to. Um, and is there a gender uh, disparity? Um, I can't remember the statistics off offhand about the the gender okay. breakdown between men and women. Um, and is there how does treat is treat can treatment be effective, or how often is there, are there medicines, are there drugs that people can take to to make things? to at least mitigate things or make things better? What's the state of medical treatment for this? Yeah, I think that, I mean, any, um, 
um, any competent, I mean, leaving aside sort of um, ant, radical anti-psychiatrist types, um, any um, mental health professional, any clinician, any competent psychiatrist would recommend medication as being you know, really essential to trying to stabilize somebody with schizophrenia. Um, the, there were generations ago hopes that there could be at some point a wonder drug, a wonder cure that would eliminate this plague forever, similar to other medical advancements that were made in the 20th century. Um, it's never really worked out like that. Um, and oftentimes one reason why it's so difficult to stabilize someone is coming up with the right you know, combination of medications um, takes a lot of time, a lot of guesswork and, and failures. The, the medications often have unpleasant side effects that contributes to the difficulty of finding a regimen that will take um, at a very high rate. Many schizophrenic people they have trouble grasping the idea that they are sick, that they do have a mental illness, and that also makes them resistant to taking medication. And sometimes when people are stabilized, um, they think that they're cured and they don't need to take medication anymore. And so they relapse um, after that. So um, it's um, very difficult work. And like I said, I think to, the, the, medi the medication portion of the um, treatment regimen, you know, will also interact with whatever else is going on in someone's life, like the personality of the social worker who they, they have to deal with. Um, whether they have some sort of housing, their relationship with friends and family. And, you know, non-medical um, treatments such as supportive employment, just something to do during the meaningful daily activities can also be um, absolutely crucial to just, you know, stabilizing someone, giving someone something to recover for, similar to what, how we talk about recovering for substance abuse. So it's a really um, complicated process trying to bring someone from a state of you know, just dangerous, fluid schizophrenia to just basic stability. Um, and, you know, clinicians will often say, it's hard to know at the beginning of that process who's with who, who it's going to succeed with and who it's not going to succeed with. Mm. And there, I mean, there, the reason this relates to criminal justice, if nothing else, um, is looking at the Washington Post database that now has 6,163 people shot and killed by police going back, I guess, to 2014 or so. Um, but by their crude breakdown, they just have a category called mental illness. Um, and 23% of those shot and killed are categorized as, yes, mental illness, as opposed to no or unknown. And I should mention that, of course, when someone, I mean, to be categorized as mentally ill in this database means it has to be pretty visible and extreme. This isn't a, I mean, it's means someone, you know, has to go, man, that, you know, that guy's crazy. I mean, how do you know, it's not like they're doing a post-mortem psychological test on the person. So I would say that's probably a pretty big undercount even, but it's a huge number. It's, it's a quarter of all people shot and killed by police are known for, to have mental illness. Um, leaving aside the difficulty in solving this problem, it still jumps out to me as, well, low-hanging fruit. If we're concerned about cops shooting and killing as many people as police do, um, that seems like a both a practical and a humane place to start. Um, how does that link to, I mean, at some point, if cops are in that situation, you know, you can say it's too late. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, cops don't want to be in that situation. And I can also say from my own experience years ago as a cop, the times that I found really scary were, you know, it's one thing to talk to someone who's angry or mad or upset and, you know, and drunk or high or whatever. But sometimes you're talking to someone, you realize, whoa, that there, there's no connection there. Their mind is somewhere else. And then suddenly sort of reason is gone, you know, what, what can you do? Um, and, you know, other than sort of back away slowly, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a scary situation for everyone involved. Um, and perhaps related to that, there've been many cases in New York in the past few years where people have um, both murdered 
other people. I'm thinking of um, in Chinatown, the guy who killed five homeless people. And then there was another case where a guy attacked a cop with a chair and uh, knocked the cop into a coma and was also shot and I think killed by the cop. Um, in, in, again, there's confirmation bias here, so I don't know. But in many of these cases, um, it seems like the family has previously tried to help that person to get them committed and the person declined that help. Do you think that's, is my summary accurate? I mean, do you, does it, or is that, or am I just sort of yeah. taking these extreme cases and extrapolating too much from them? Yeah, I looked at the Washington Post uh, data somewhat closely a few months ago myself as well. And yeah, if you're talking about like about a thousand um, police shoot, fatal police shootings a year, 200 to 250 of them involve mental illness. Um, you know, the vast majority of those were the individual was armed and he was attacking the cop. <clears throat> so, um, and those types of circumstances, I don't know um, how much de -escal we would expect from de-escalation tactics. Um, but even in those cases, you know, we do want to talk about how the mental health system um, allowed that situation to become so bad. I mean, because the, the, the mental illness problem has driven a lot of criminal justice reform at each stage of the criminal justice reform debate, whether you're talking about like, um, you know, closed records, bail reform, at some, the, the, this mental, this criminalization of mental illness problem is invoked as, as a justification for why we need to do this criminal justice thing. But in the mental health reform context, mental health reformers always invoke that same phenomenon, the high rate of mental illness amongst the incarcerated or high rate of uh, mental illness related police shootings as, as um, a reason why we need to do mental health reform. And, you know, I think the mental health reformers have the sounder point. I mean, if this is all, if we're, if we're really interested in, you know, going upstream and prevent and taking a preventative approach to social policy questions, then we really need to look at mental health reform, not as much criminal justice reform to deal with this, um, this problem of the criminalization of mental illness, so-called. Um, yeah, most people did, uh, you know, they had, they had housing at one point, they had their, at one point their bridges were not burned with their friends and family, um, and the situation deteriorated. Generations ago, prior to deinstitutionalization and the um, dra dramatic reduction in the, um, the institutionalized population, what a family did when they knew they had an uncontrollable adult relative is they put them in a hospital, um, just like you know, developmentally disabled um, teenagers were put in a home essentially for the rest of their lives. Um, mentally ill people were put in a hospital and often, um, oftentimes they would live the rest of their lives um, um, in, a, in a mental hospital. Um, for various reasons, we decided not to do that anymore. But as a result, that thrust this huge burden on families. Like families are now said to be the new asylums. It's sort of interesting to me that generations ago, when we tend to think about family structure as stronger than it is now, um, families relied, were able to rely much more heavily on the government um, than they can now and the mental illness concept and context. Families are a little bit weaker, more unstable than they used to be, but also they have this, these huge responsibilities placed on them in terms of trying to deal with their um, mentally ill adult relatives. So we've tried to build this community services system to replace the, the old institutional system. Um, for a lot of people, it, is, it has benefited them. Um, but the lows are very lows in terms of the way this whole reform program played out. So I, I presume, as is often the case, Western European countries are doing it better than we are. Maybe Canada is, I don't know. Um, and I say that because when I'm in Amsterdam, you just, there are not as many visibly mentally ill people sort of ranting and raving on the streets. Um, what what do they do that we don't or what I mean it's another way of asking what should we do but I'm you know trying to say is there is there a sort of model that while not perfect um, would certainly be a big improvement over what we have yeah I'm not enough of an expert on the European situation 
as I should be. Um, um, I would say that inpatient psychiatric, in terms of measures of inpatient psychiatric beds, America doesn't look great compared to other countries. Um, but, um, and I know um, groups in California who have, I think very highly of the model applied in Trieste, in the Trieste um, region, city, city of Trieste. But I'm really not enough of an expert on the European system um, to, uh, to give you a useful- but Trieste, and this is in Northeast Italy, has a yeah. model that is unique to Trieste. I've never heard of it. Oh. Highly regarded, yes, oh. by some groups in Italy. Um, how much of, I mean, God, in the, what was the recent case? Oh, with the guy who attacked the woman um, when the doormen were accused of not helping, um, incorrectly, I believe, accused of not helping. But, um, you know, it turned out that man had been convicted of murdering his mother, um, which is never a good sign. Um, but I always, in these cases that at least make the news, um, it is hard not to feel really sorry for the family that, is trying, you know, wants to do good, presumably, and just can't cope. I mean, that's not, not their fault. Uh, maybe no one can cope. And he just said, well, if the government doesn't step in, um, we, yeah, it's putting families that are already stretched to the limit in, in very precarious situations. But I, I can't help but feel that if your family gets together and decides that, so, you know, a member of the family needs to be committed, um, and I, I'd want some independent judge and doctor to make sure, you know, they're just not out to get you. But yeah. um if your family says we we can't, you know, this this needs to be done, it probably should be done. Is my thought that the the you know that that it, there should be a reason then at that point to show why commitment isn't needed. Um, but clearly, that level of care and or commitment isn't happening, right? Um, yeah, still choose to simply decline. Right, and it has to be a value. You know, when when the the, the commitment commission question comes up um at the legal process that has to be gone through in which um the individual adult has a public defender who will resist um the um the um suggestion to to commit them and it's and it's a pretty high standard that's been developed especially in new york um imminent dangerousness to self or others um you know often somebody who's been um, hospitalized for 72 hours held um, is, you know, slightly better off than they were when they first came in. And so they don't seem to be dangerous. They don't meet that dangerousness standard. So they have to be out again. Another problem that families um, have in terms of their, their standing and the level of respect that's accorded their judgment is um, they are barred from um, health information about their adult relative through HIPAA law. Um, they, um, the medical professionals, um, when, after somebody becomes 18, are um, not, not supposed to share that information regarding how his treatment is going um, with his family caregivers. Um, and families are, find this very frustrating. Um, and uh, there have been efforts to um, reform HIPAA law to make accommodation for this particular situation, but it really has not gone as far as it needs to, mostly because of the resistance by disability rights groups who, you know, find it objectionable. And are they, do those rights groups generally, are they talking about mental illness or are they talking about other disabilities that, and then that over the umbrella of HIPAA gets applied to everybody? It, it, they're talking about the mental illness. So the same groups that resist um, weakening um, civil commitment laws, weakening um, or encouraging more use of inpatient hospitalization, always the specter of the one flu over the cuckoo's nest or um, snake pit days. It's always hovers, even though we're talking about a situation that hasn't been a reality for many, many decades at this point, it remains very prominent in resisting any sort of backsliding in their view. So I'm sure if we did return even in part to any sort of large, larger scale institutionalization, undoubtedly there would be scandals of abuse, you know, maybe not as extreme as one flew over this cuckoo's nest, but like, you know, at some point, if you're being involuntary committed, there is a prison element to that, even if it's a more benign form of incarceration, you can't leave, right? 
Um, right. So you could argue, yeah. I mean, you could argue that um, uh, that uh, being put in when a schizophrenic person is put in jail, that's um, better than if they are put in a hospital. Hospital. If you're if you're involuntarily committed to a hospital, you haven't done anything. You haven't been charged with anything. But when you're being put in, when you've been charged with a crime and held on a pretrial detention basis in jail, well, that's just like anybody else. That's the normal process that any non-mentally ill person experiences. So, um, oh, I mean, maybe there's some, maybe they hand out various drugs and, um, you know, sedatives. Uh, but whatever mental illness you have going into jail, it's hard to imagine it be getting better during your time. No, right. Yeah, of course. And, um, and mental illness, uh, mental hospital, and, you know, jail and prison reform, we, you know, we're talking about like reforming the conditions and like, how nice do you want to make it? Um, because it is after all, a jail and prison. Um, mental hospitals can be made, you know, as nice as we want them in terms of um, opportunities for recreation and, you know, food and so forth. Um, I mean, it's a difficult environment because it's, only, only the very hardest cases get committed to mental hospitals these days. But we have in place many regulations um, and just a cultural oversight that didn't exist during the battle days that has improved the quality of inpatient hospitalization. We also have just more money um, to spend on it. Um, and um, uh, the, this, because the population is so much smaller than it used to be the staffing ratios are higher and that's another metric of just, just the quality um, of hospitalization so yes it ultimately this does come down to how much do you trust a government agency to not um, some sometimes falter um, allow some sort of abuse or maltreatment to occur ultimately you know you have to trust these systems to some degree, how much do you trust them? I don't know. But there are certain reasons to think that it wouldn't be as bad as the battle days. Hmm. One of the, on a more, in a less extreme cases, and I want to be careful in this sort of segue transition because I'm not implying that homeless people are all mentally ill, much less violent, um, but shifting a little to visit to the visible street homeless population. Um, you mentioned before the difficulty in commitment laws. Um, if I'm not mistaken, isn't aren't doesn't New York State have two different standards? One being the imminent threat uh, that say police officers can use, but can't doctors also commit someone for some? I don't know what the term is, but basically being dysfunctional, not being able to take care of oneself. So is it gravely disabled? Is a standard that um, some states have. Um, I believe the only standard in that, and that's a separate one from dangerousness. Yes. Um, but I mentioned um, that because when, I think it's just dangerous. Be good. Back when the NYPD had a homeless outreach unit before it was defunded. Um, one of the things they would do is go out with doctors um, to get, to have a, both so there'd be a doctor there. Uh, and, but also I think to have a easier, or a lower standard of, of commitment um, for people that were clearly, you know, on the street uh, and not taking care of themselves. I mean, the idea that we should just let people stay on the street um, because they decline services strikes me as incredibly inhumane. Um, it's a weird callousness. We're just supposed to go, okay, they said no, so just leave them be. I don't know. That, that bugs me both from a common humanity standpoint and also as a resident of the city. Um, because, you know, if someone's on the subway and, you know, there, there are other riders that, that should also be part of that uh, policy calculus. But, but looking just at the person who needs help, um, the police would commit people to Bellevue. And, yeah. and the problem, at least, and I don't know, you know, Bellevue, may, Bellevue Hospital, this is, may beg to differ, um, but they don't seem interested in actually treating people. Um, I don't know if that's because it's a money issue, if it's because they're overloaded, um, but they're, you know, once the, once the cops bring you to Bellevue, it's out of police hands and it's in doctor's hands. And because of HIPAA, we really don't know well what, on an individual case, we have no clue what happens. Um, but they said the person would just be released and they would be released without any um, 
yeah, with, because of HIPAA, there'd be no question of, you know, there'd be no way to follow up on future treatment. Um, there were no ser social services greeting people. So, um, you know, they just sort of walk out of Bellevue at some random time and, you know, and, and yeah. go right. And, and so I guess, I mean, it's just, it seems it's so frustrating from their perspective because they're trying to do the right thing, trying to get people help, but the system doesn't even seem to help people when they're supposed to be getting help. So I don't. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they ride, you know, most of the people on the street have been hospitalized, the, the mentally ill population on the street have been hospitalized at some point, but it would have been a brief duration. Yeah. Um, is there is there a problem in the label of homelessness because it implies the issue? Well, I, don't, I mean, the term itself maybe doesn't necessarily, but it's well to emphasize housing as opposed to health. Um, is that a problem? Do you think that homeless in the, the way that um, homeless, uh, I don't know, politicians or advocates, or I don't know, uh, or maybe I'm making a straw man argument here, but I don't think I am in, in categorizing homelessness as one primarily of housing and economic conditions. Is that? Oh yeah. I mean, absolutely. The, um, before the modern homelessness crisis emerged around 1980, the term homelessness or homeless didn't have anywhere near the currency that it has now and that it developed in the early 1980s. Going back to you know the early um, 20th century, we talked about tramps, we talked about hobos, we talked about bums. During the Skid Row era in the old days of the Bowery, we especially talked about bums. Not as much homelessness. Some social researchers would use the term. It didn't have, it wasn't the common popular term and also the catch-all umbrella term um, that it is now. Um, and that was deliberate on the part of advocacy groups to force that term into the debate in order to press the case for um, how more, more support for housing, essentially. And that, um, that was always um, the basic idea for almost inventing the term homelessness around the time of 1980. Um, the debate has taken a few different turns over the years. But yeah, the general goal is um, to increase support for more government spending on subsidized housing programs, especially. And that's why people, even now, there are sometimes, um, you know, as we're like deciding that old, some terms are offensive that used to be just like ordinary terms, um, <clears throat> the, more commonly, you, so, with increasing frequency, we're hearing the term people experiencing homelessness instead of saying, calling someone a homeless person. Um, but still, they can't break from that basic term, because that would then seem to diminish the idea that what need, what's needed above all is more housing, as opposed to a more effective mental health system. Homeless has to be conceived of as a housing problem if you're trying to build support for more housing. And of course, if, as an umbrella term for most people experiencing homelessness, it is a housing problem. Um, if you look at, I mean, so, but in terms of, and the overlap with the police and criminal justice is, is really a small segment of that. It's a portion of, uh, well, some in shelters, but a portion, you know, so we're talking about the street homeless. So the, you know, New York has roughly 80,000 people in the homeless and in the shelter system, I think, um, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, the vast majority of those people are housed at some level, be it in shelters or hotels or, or temporary housing or however the system does yeah. or doesn't deal with that. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm, for, I'm not talking about that group. It's an important group and, you know, and they need help. And I think we, you know, housing is part of the solution, but to then take people who are on the street with serious mental illness and, you know, group them with a family, you know, a mom with kids who go to school every day. It's just, those are different populations. And there seems to be a grave disservice to sort of label them with the same uh, category, no matter what semantics we're going to use to describe it. We're talking about different situations and different solutions, I would think. And um, yeah, the umbrella term homelessness or unhoused or, you know, we can, play around with the language as much as we want um, is not the issue when we're dealing with people with severe mental illness. I mean, just 
I don't know quite what my point is, other than it's weird to prioritize the homeless, the housing element of it when there's such an obvious mental. Uh, well, and it's yeah. I mean, there's the. Um, I mean, there. I mean, it's it's irritating because I mean, having studied the history of it a little bit, as I said, it was deliberate to to try to to wrench all these different problems together under the same term, and also it points towards a different standard of success. Um, you know, this how how is the city doing these days with its homelessness problem? Generally, I would say most policymakers would say, well, how many permanent supportive housing units did you bring online last year? How much housing did you build? You have a homelessness problem in that, that is you succeed in meeting that problem by uh, by building more housing. Well, what did you do on the mental health front? Um, well, I don't know. That's what mental health agencies are supposed to do. So if you how you conceive about the problem, how you conceive of the problem, how you talk about it points immediately to how you're evaluating yourself and making progress with that problem. Hmm. What is the history? What happened in the 80s that contributed to the what we have today? Well, I would say deinstitutionalization played a big part of it. Deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill started in the 1950s, but really got going beginning in the late 60s and throughout the 70s. Just, just huge reduction in beds. And the harder cases, not like senile old people, those were the first people to be released from the institutions. And that was a um, large percentage the harder... of the institute. It yes. Was, it was an old folks home for a lot of people. Um... Absolutely. Yeah. Before we had nursing homes in the way we have them now. Yeah. The old people were put in um, psychiatric hospitals. Yeah. As much as a third at the peak, I think. And I mentioned um, that so... a lot of people draw a direct line between deinstitutionalization and incarceration. Um, and I'm there probably is some link there, but it's not the same population we're talking about who were by and large who were in the mental institutions in the 50s and 60s and prisons in the 80s and 90s. Well, it was um, the, the old psychiatric hospitals were dumping grounds for sure. And a lot of different problems were dumped on them. Um, and so, but the hard case population, the chronically mentally ill population, those are the ones as the pressure to keep going pushing the census and the hospitals down really got going more aggressively in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, that's then right before the homelessness problem emerges in the way that we recognize it. And also that's right before when people start talking about the high rate of the elevated rate of mental illness amongst the incarcerated population. There are all the, also things going on in the way that government's paid for the stuff. Medicaid came online in the 60s when Medicaid was passed, um, the federal government said, we're not about to be put on the hook for these expensive, failing state psychiatric systems. We will only pay for community-based services. So the state said, well, okay, if we can build a federal government for community-based services through Medicaid, well, then let's put people in a system where they can, we can build a federal government for that. So Medicaid also contributed in a big way to deinstitutionalization. And again, in that crucial decade of the 70s, immediately before these newer problems that we're familiar with developed around 1980. And was part of that, can we blame Reagan for budget cuts or was that not a, was that not a big factor? Well, the, Reagan was president right when these, you know, bag ladies, um, you know, street people emerged. In, the, in this bad recession around in the early 1980s, the worst recession since the, um, the Great Depression at that time. And so the coincidence of Reagan, the Reagan administration and the, the, the situation on the streets was created this like powerful co correlation in, in, in many people's minds. Um, also, there was a there were there were people who were very active and effective um, advocates of the, of, the home, of the homeless who focused their energies on Washington, D.C., particularly this guy named Mitch Snyder, the most influential homeless advocate in history. Um, and he particularly um, focused his energies on criticizing Reagan. It's totally unrealistic that a presidential administration that takes office and you know, um, the, the very, like right before people started, that, that a presidential administration could have that immediate effect. Reagan, what Reagan did as governor of California is a different story and much more problematic. But as president, um, 
No, this would this had more to do with um, long developing problems related to the, the skid row neighborhoods, the low rent housing market, um, and deinstitutionalization. About that low end housing market, one of my quick fixes in my mind to the problem of a lot of homelessness is to bring back SRO, single room occupancy, the old fashioned flop house. Um, I and so I was born in 1971. I you know I actually do remember the rise of today's homelessness problem in the early 80s. It was visible in Chicago. People that weren't out there before suddenly were out there. Um, and I mention that in part because I think, I don't know if Americans are worse at this, but we tend to think problems are, you know, well, they're inevitable, nothing we can do about it. Like, no, we didn't, it didn't used to exist. So again, I might not know the solution, but I know there was a, there was an America in which this wasn't such a big problem. I mean, you could say the same thing with, you know, mass shootings, like this is not, you know, we, we have a strange tolerance to these things, I think, which is irksome to me, but the flop house was, and I believe it was because progressives were about, you know, advocated against them. They were, they were, they were banned. Um, there's a grand in New York, there's a grandfather rule. So they're like still like three left, I think. Um, but it is actually illegal to open up a hotel geared, you know, towards cheap, uh, barely, um, you know, you know, the lowest possible standard, they're a flop house. Um, but they do give people the door they can lock a bathroom down the hall. Um, and that, I mean, no, it's not a great living condition, but compared to what, I mean, literally, I think on the bar where you have, there was a, I think a times article, I don't know, a year or two ago, but I mean, they're literally people sleeping in the doorway of the old flop house that they used yeah. to sleep inside of. Um, is that a, sort of a simple solution we could say is, yeah, we just got to bring back privately run for-profit um, crappy hotels. Well, a lot of it depends on um, how um, our tolerance for squalid housing. Um, you know, when the, when the flop houses thrived, so to speak, middle-class standards for housing were, um, were lower than they are now just a regular working class, middle class family probably lived in a somewhat more smaller, um, maybe not as nice um, housing on average than, than they do now. Um, um, so what are we, and the, the, the steady mark, you know, in previous generations, housing policy was about improving quality. Um, it's now all almost completely about affordability. There's obviously a correlation there as general housing standards get, got better and better, quality on average is better and better, it became less affordable. So we're, we're still struggling to square that circle. Um, you know, very, very poor people, it's completely uneconomical to build new housing for people with almost no um, income. Um, so you have to talk about somehow letting um, existing properties drop down in quality um, and letting them operate in that way. Um, uh, there are certain forms of low quality housing that exists in New York City, for example, to these three quarters housing operations. They draw especially from like people coming out of prison, um, people with substance use disorders. Um, they have a pretty bad reputation and the city has tried has not been accommodating to say the least, um, despite all the lessons that supposedly learned about the demolition of the Bowery. The, the, the other th big advantage the Bowery had, along with all the other Skid Row neighborhoods, is that they, they, were, they, were a, they were a whole economic order. They were sort of containment zone. And, and under, and it was understood that conditions would be more disorderly there than in the rest of the city. Um, Police, as you probably know, had wider authority to police the boundaries of those districts through the use of vagrancy law, especially. And, um, and but there were, you know, pawn shops and day labor opportunities and stuff. Um, when homeless housing for the homeless is built now, it's generally thought it needs to be somehow spread throughout the integrated. Each different neighborhood should bear its share for housing the homeless. We would have to overcome that and re-embrace this idea of a some sort of, of a sort of like disorder zone, containment zone. Um, and that too, um, you know, it's not clear how far 
typical city politicians are willing to go. Because similar with just the basic question of housing quality, like how much disorder are we willing to tolerate? Um, but does, I mean, LA, doesn't LA do that? But without any of the housing? Skid Row in LA was, was an understood to be a containment zone approach. Yes, we will, we were gonna hang on to our Skid Row district while other cities are, are demolishing theirs. And, but we're gonna, we're gonna, so we're gonna just, it's sort of, it's harm reduction. We can't make the problem go away. We're going to confine it to this neighborhood. But it didn't work in the sense that homelessness is everywhere in L.A. County now. The total homeless population of L.A. County that's in Skid Row is less than 10%. Um, so, yeah, you still have Skid Row in L.A., but you also have homelessness everywhere. And so um, it, it just these practical, these very serious practical barriers um, come up when you're trying to re-establish the old Bowery idea. I mean, scholars back in the 80s who really knew the culture of the Bowery, who had studied it, and were in a position to compare that with the new culture of modern homelessness, um, which is defined especially by living in a shelter. Like, what's better, living in an old SRO or cycling in between the streets and the shelter. It seems like a lot of people preferred the SRO. You know, one thing you can always say in favor of the flop house is there's very, there was less st actual street homelessness. Um, well, that's it, people, people had a roof and a locked door and a mailing yeah. address. Yeah. Partly because they were, for, they were not government run, which means they could enforce rules somewhat arbitrarily. I mean, the stereotype yeah. is some, you know, some, some, crusty old guy with a cigar and a raspy voice you know uh, but you know that there were rules and if you know so obviously some people still didn't follow them but for the and were evicted kicked out um, but for the people who live there at least there was presumably problems and all a greater a certain amount of just basic safety I mean you know they were they weren't getting they didn't live at risk of getting robbed every time they went to sleep um, that again I'm a big fan of better as opposed to perfect or ideal or utopian um, and it just... They didn't have strong tenant protections. One of the things which really gave the kind of mercy blow to the old flop houses, which as you say, hung on for a long, longer time than many people understand in the nineties was the application of eviction protections to um, SRO tenants. And so after a certain point, like land, those, those old school landlords decided it was just so much more economical to sell their building, let it be converted to something else. They can't operated. Um, so, you know, like that, that in, in, in tenant protections is another definition of housing quality. So um, would we allow these different facilities to operate um, w w where people could be evicted from with much more, you know, much more easily? Um, I don't know. So going back to your essay, uh, because we've talked about the problems here. The essays are, you know, cover a broad range of issue, but the one theme is they have to provide some solutions, short and medium term solutions. And you, you write about supervision. So how is that, what do you mean? And how is that part of the answer? Yeah, well, I think, um, so for people who are involved in the criminal justice system and who are, um, you know, you this could mean community supervision in the way that we don't really talk about community supervision, um, probation style programs. You're charged with offense, an offense that's more serious than, um, I don't know, public urination, but less serious than uh, murder. Um, you could be facing a prison sentence of a few years, but the you go before the judge and the judge tells you, um, if you will comply, you know, if you will participate in, the, in this program's requirements, if you will check in regularly with your social worker, um, if you'll submit to drug testing, we will let these charges pass. Um, you know, New York does this with mental health court programs. Um, we need to uh, accept the idea that the criminal justice system can play a constructive role in addressing mental illness, that in fact, many people in the criminal justice system probably understand mental illness better than so-called mental health professionals, because not all mental health professionals work with violent schizophrenic people. 
Um, but that's one thing you could definitely do. You can also do- It's an interesting concept, by the way, selection bias sort of working on the other side. That if yeah. You, you know, I hadn't thought of that. Um, um, you, um, and that's just generally something we need to understand is that the criminal justice system can be helpful. It's not, the, the point is not just divert people away from the criminal justice system because um, that's just chaos. But getting back to the supervision question, um, we need to have more essentially supervision. Um, so th other, there are also forms of civil commitment, civil commitment. So you haven't been charged with a crime, but you know, you're, you're having a lot of problems. Um, and for your benefit, we need to um, apply some sort of involuntary commitment to you. So that, that could mean in a hospital, um, and, but that can also be in, in the community through the, the Kendra's Law program. Kendra's Law is a program of outpatient, assisted outpatient commitment. So you have to regularly go before a judge. You have to check in, um, comply with the treatment regimen. Um, and this is a program that, so we, you're not falling through the cracks when you're in Kendra's Law. We're, we're keeping sight of you. We're making sure you're remaining stable. Um, and this is a program that has been extensively studied um, and it's shown that it's very good at keeping people out of out of jails um, and also out of homelessness. Then we need then there could be supervision that doesn't involve um, doesn't involve the criminal justice system or courts at all. Um, but meaning the con the community mental health system, as people normally talk about that. Um, but we need to be talking about um, more basically supervision of that system because. You know, one thing that strikes me about these subway pushings and these spectacular tragedies is like, I'm sorry, did some social, who's, what social service agency was supposed to be looking out for this guy? Did they lose their contract? Who, who, do we have any type of accountability in place to make sure that these groups that we're giving huge, huge contracts to um, are contributing to a solution to that? And that maybe they have a little bit of skin in the game if, if these problems persist. Um, so we need to make sure that we are requiring um, the mental health services system, meaning especially like nonprofit organizations to whom we give contracts, um, to focus on seriously mentally ill individuals um, and exercise some sort of oversight and accountability if they're if they're not keeping track. One of one of the, it always bugs me when people when these subway pushings, well, he slipped through the cracks. I'm like, but that implies there's some floor, or some mesh net that was supposed to hold them. And I go, there, there are no cracks he slipped through. It's just, it's a free fall. You know, if someone in child protective services gets killed, um, you can say that person slipped through the cracks because there's a system and the person, you know, the kid's being monitored. Um, we don't have, yeah, where are, where's the accountability for any of these social service groups? And I, I mean, one of the I say it a lot on Twitter, um, but, you know, Department of Homeless Services in New York City now has a budget of about $3 billion. Um, and that doesn't include other programs like Thrive NYC and all, you know, it, right. it's uh, the budget of the NYPD is less than $6 billion. Um, $3 billion is a lot of money. Yes. And so it seems like the least we could ask in return for that is someone is accountable and says, oh, that person that pushed someone in a subway train, like, yeah, we messed up. Um, or you know what, my bad things might happen. We didn't mess up. Maybe, you know, it's, it will, sometimes it just happens, but nobody says, oh, that was our charge. Um, right. And that like, so we, we, where is this money going? And will, will somebody at least step up and say, we're going to handle this. Um, this is our, this is our domain. And, and I don't see any of that. And I wonder how much of that is, um, you know, bureaucratic, some of it's incompetence, some of it's just the nature of a large bureaucracy, but then you add to that a certain amount of um, corruption, um, a certain amount of, I worry that perhaps people who profit uh, from the suffering of others, uh, I mean, and I don't even, I do mean it maliciously deep down, but I don't even necessarily mean it maliciously that they want it to keep, they want to perpetuate the problems because um, they don't actually get the incentives of the system to not encourage solutions. If you yeah, I mean, we yeah, just so need to be more honest about what types of mental health problems we're trying to address. Um, you know, programs that exist to assist school children who are bullied in schools, those are mental health programs. Those are part of the mental health system. Those are programs that are very valuable to those the families of bullied youths, but they can't really be said to be doing anything about subway 
publishings. Um, but there is this like alighting that goes on where people will say, well, yeah, when I'm working with children, I'm trying to prevent subway pushings. I'm, I'm taking an upstream approach. But really, in some sense, you're trying to work on a different problem, in some ways an easier problem, but at the very least you can say it's just a very different problem. And we need to be more sort of forthright about who really is working on subway pushings and not postpartum depression for homeless women, anxiety for school children, things like that. These are just entirely different. This is the Thrive NYC problem. Well, assuming that subway pushers are vastly disproportionately visibly homeless and not riding the subway to get to work, um, we could, that's something that we absolutely could police our way out of. It won't solve the mental illness problem, but it'll solve the subway pushing problem if that person isn't allowed to remain in the subway by choice. Um, that's a pretty easy solution. That's a policy decision. Um, you know, where will they go? I don't know. Um, but at some point we have to take the subway system into account too. It can't exclusively be um, about the care of the individual, even if the care of the individual should be the primary focus at some point. Yeah, just, I don't want you pushing people on the subway. Um, but that's, these are choices that, you know, subway rules used to be enforced and that changed under uh, de Blasio. Um, seems pretty and, simple to go back to the way it was for the previous 15 years. And also you need to be talking about like protecting the homeless population itself. One of the least studied problems in homelessness policy is homeless on homeless crime. I mean, you mentioned earlier the Chinatown murders, also the, the, the incident down in the, near the South Street Seaport and the, um, the incident of the, the, the H, with the, who the Post called the A-Train Ripper, um, a number of his victims were their homeless people. Very frequently um, the, when the, these violent crimes occurred, the victim is a homeless person. You know, the, 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 the situation anything that occurs inside a shelter has to have been perpetuated by a homeless person because nobody else can get into a shelter other than homeless people. So, you know, um, you know, George Kelling wrote um, when he, when subway rules were written and then uh, uh, verified the constitution constitutionality was upheld by the courts. Um, George Kelling wrote um, that the key moment was um, gay, was gaining the moral high ground. Um, and he said that happened when sub when people were being ejected from the subway for violating rules and put into vans uh, that would, was taking them to services and shelters. And there were advocates um, literally trying to drag people out of vans so they could remain in the subway system. And um, he believed till the day he died, and I concur with this belief that it is not humane the subway is not a good shelter system um, because of danger, uh, because of lack of facilities. Um, and so once you, the idea that somehow, yeah, so you have to gain a moral high ground that this isn't just about being mean um, to make other people's lives less unpleasant. Uh, it's a, also, yeah, it, it's dangerous. Um, most crime is not yeah, I assume that actually most of the crime down there is homeless on, the victims are homeless people as well, um, as easy targets. Um, that seems like it should matter more than I think it does. Um, but I don't know. Um, who, is there a, are there, is there a rational voice on these issues? I mean, part of a problem with any of these niche problems, um, because granted, still, again, you know, the number of people being pushed in front of subway trains is not large, um, but most people simply have other things to worry about. They're not focusing on these things. Um, it's sort of the loudest voice in the room problem. Who, um, who well, yeah. The transit workers union have been pretty vocal about it. You know, these are these are frontline heroes who are still going to work in the dark days of March and April and having to steward these, you know, mobile homeless day, day shelters. Um, um, it's and, amazing um, to me that progressive politicians in New York City ignore the minority majority transit union, you know, blue collar uh, minority workers who are saying, um, we need more policing down here. And yeah, progressive politicians talk about decolonization and defunding. Um, that's, that's an odd disconnect to me, but. I mean, very, yeah, very often. They don't have enough um, power. Go ahead. Now, just saying politically, the union apparently doesn't have enough clout because I don't think they're winning this battle, but it is a voice that should be heard more. Yeah, and um, I think that 
with the situation with the reopening, um, you know, pr- frames this challenge in a much different way because traditionally, um, you know, you rely you rely on crowds to regulate disorder um, in this you know traditional Jane Jacobs way, um, and um, <clears throat> you know maybe tour we might see tourists coming back to some degree in the summer, but the commuters who are a huge portion of those crowds, um, I think there's a lot more uncertainty about um, if or when they're coming back. And you know, relying on crowds is a non-governmental, um, non-public safety response disorder. Um, but then you know, the ball gets put in the lap of the government and public safety agencies if that, if that solution remains unavailing for the time being. And- the number, you know, I got one. Do you know what is the estimate for the number of people living in the subways? Um, it's we're talking hundreds. It's not thousands. Well, tr- when New York City does its street count, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, at least half of this unsheltered population is found in the subways and the train stations um, at Grand Central and Penn Station. So that street count is probably a pretty severe undercount of the actual street homeless, but it's anyway, it's what the data we have. So, yeah. And, um, you know, there are more people, like one statistic I can give you, there are more people living in the subway system than in, than in Queens. This, the street count tends to turn up a very small number of people living, um, above ground in Queens and Queens is enormous. I mean, Queens is like the size of Houston and, but by the terms, so there's a way in which the subway system like sucks in um, many of the unsheltered, much of the unsheltered population away from the other boroughs. I mean, it's Manhattan in the subway system that re- you find the street population really concentrated in New York City. Yeah. Um, we, despite my, always my, sure, yeah. we've gone over an hour, I think by now. Um, and I try to limit it there, but we could go on. Um, I want to, yeah, thank you. And um, we've really talked about two diverge. I worry about the fact that we sort of blended homelessness and, and mentally ill here, um, when it is always important to put a legitimate caveat that you know what we're not saying is that everyone out there is some violent homicidal maniac by any means. But these problems do overlap, um, and they're often not talked about honestly. So I, I appreciate um, your essay to the Violence Reduction Project and um, what you've had to say here. Um, any last minute thoughts on your mind? That Yeah, you know, when we talk about the broader problems with violence in New York City, you know, you're talking about like gangs, right? Surely the homeless population contributes less to the murder rate than gangs. Um, throughout the 2010s, we saw soaring single adult homelessness but a moderate to declining um, serious crime rate. Um, so there is a way in which these are different problems, but you know, the, the um, disorder, it's, if for no other reason than dis- the need to address disorder itself, um, we are going to need to somehow come to terms with the role of the criminal justice system, including the police, um, in addressing the homelessness challenge um, in all its complexity. Oh, thanks. Um, that is Stephen Ida. It's Stephen with a PH and Ida is spelled E-I-D-E. And um, this uh, podcast is up at qualitypolicing.com and you can also get a link there and click through to the Violent Reduction Project and read his essay on um, these issues. Um, Stephen is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, and he looks at state and local finance and social policy questions, um, particularly homelessness and mental illness. And I am Peter Moskos, and this has been Quality Policing. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 